The soldier, though a soldier of peace. I have a dream. That one day. A soldier of peace. This nation will rise up. A soldier of peace. Live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. I have a dream. Though a soldier of peace. I have a dream. Nonviolence Radio, covering the beat of nonviolence worldwide from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California. Welcome, everybody, to another Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook, and I'm here in the studio with my co host and news anchor covering all of the nonviolence that's not reported in the news, or at least a taste of it, Michael Nagler. And we're with the Meta Center for Nonviolence, and we're here at our mother station, KWMR. Nonviolence is not passivity. It's an active force that draws from the harm and intention that um, of the intentions that we have to do good in the world. And it gives it a really constructive way of making those maybe we could say negative tendencies or, or feelings of incapacity, turning it into a capacity and a force for positive change in the world. And a lot of the work is focused in these constructive alternatives to the systems that aren't working. For example, uh, mass production of food, you know, our mass food system. So local food is an example of a constructive way of supporting a nonviolent future. And similarly, the question is, well, what do we do about war? What do we do about human conflict? And one of our favorite alternatives is called civilian protection, unarmed civilian protection in particular. And one of our favorite organizations out there in the world is the Nonviolent Peace Force. And we have on the show today two peacemakers, two, two unarmed civilian protectors from both one from Mindanao, one from South Sudan, who happen to be at the United Nations this week and from the uh, Nonviolent Peace Force joining us. So. I'm going to start with our interview so you can find out what unarmed civilian protection is and the work that they're doing in South Sudan and Mindanao. Uh, Yasmin Madani is here uh, on the phone from New York. Hi, Yasmin. Hi, how are you? Um, Thank you so much for joining us, and I'm doing great here in the studio. Uh, Tell us about, you know, you're with the Nonviolent Peace Force. Are you working in South Sudan as a uh, peacekeeper there, a civilian protector there? Yes, uh, I've been in uh, South Sudan for a year and a few months now Mm -hmm. uh, doing civilian peacekeeping uh, as a uh, protection officer. Um, And uh, it's, as you said, very rewarding. Um, A wonderful country and wonderful people. So it's been a great opportunity to work with NP um, conducting unarmed civilian peacekeeping in a very difficult um, environment and situation. And how do you how do you keep yourself safe with that if you're not armed? Is that that must be a question that people have for you? If you're if you if you're in a war zone or you're in a high conflict, a high intensity conflict, how are you protecting yourself? Um, it's a good question, and it's come up some it's come up quite a bit this mm-hmm. week. Um, I think, in all honesty, we we protect ourselves by putting trust in the community. And uh, with the people that we live with, and uh, just as much as they put their trust in us to be able to protect them, um, we live with them. We're with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So we we try to be as much part of the community as possible um, to let them know who we are and what we stand for, and um, how we can help them, and how they can help us, so that I, uh, in a way, the principle of Peacekeeping turns from one of needing to have weapons in order to ensure safety to one of needing community cohesion and engagement to keep peace. Right. And and how can, what are some ways that you've been able to then put trust in the community? Do you have a story or some way of helping us to better understand the work that you're, you really are doing besides just the trust that they have in you and you have in them? Uh, what have been some situations that you've had to help support? Well, there. Yeah, so I guess 
because we are present in the community, it allows us to build relationship with them, um, to understand um, what then what the community's needs are, what they are going through, to experience even a fraction of what they experience. Uh, the conflict in South Sudan has been going on for so long, so the displacement is uh, massive. There's a lot of refugees and IDPs um, all across the country, and most of the area of the country is hard to reach for a lot of NGOs mm-hmm. and um, humanitarian agencies. So we, MP is present in these areas that are hard to reach, and we live with the community. So it means not only are we involved in almost direct contact with government, opposition groups, with the community, we are also liaising with the international community to make sure that people get food, um, services come to them, they're able to move around, um, and we do this by helping set up a community peacekeeping initiatives, especially women peacekeeping teams who negotiate and almost implement their own protection um, work. For example, um, as you said, to have an example of what's happening. Um, so we have women peacekeeping teams who who have gone through our training, through the training of unarmed civilian peacekeeping, have gone to for example, all from different ethnic groups have gone to their own commanders and commissioners and have negotiated access through checkpoints so that they can, for the first time in a really long time, cross the road um, so that they won't be raped when they go through every checkpoint so that they can go collect firewood, so that they can go get um, food from the distribution sites, um, they can receive medical center, and MP does that one by accompanying them, the women, so that they are safe and nothing happens to them when we cross the checkpoints, when we cross, um, you know, uh, bridges or community lines, um, but also so that they can do it themselves, so that they have the means to be able to go and talk to those in power and say, I am going to cross this road and you will not attack me or you will not rape me, you will not hurt me. Um, and we do that by building the relationship with the the individuals that will, might or will cause harm but also with government officials, um, with the community. Um, so it's a lot of work that goes into ensuring that, that the women and children and men are able to cross and get access safely. Mm-hmm. So just helping people to live out their normal lives in a way where they don't have to be afraid of violence happening to them or to those around them. Yeah. And helping them then to create strategies, as you said, that where the nonviolent peace force is there for a little bit, but at some point you're going to have to go. And Absolutely. So it's it, you're trying to build resiliency into your into your methods. And yeah. of course, yeah, the, the entire UCP principle is about resiliency. It's about um, enhancing community or in-house protection strategies, monitoring strategies. Um, general livestock, like how do you take it, how have you always taken care of your community? Mm-hmm. And how we, do we use that and make it better? But we don't, we are not the ones who suggest how to improve these things. We let the community tell us how they want to improve things. Mm-hmm. And we do that with them. And because we live with them, right? I mean, we we live in the same places that they do. We eat the same food that they do. We are with them 24-7, which means we get to see if they don't like something or they want something changed. We also, at times, can see why they want that and we either agree or not agree. But either way, the decision is not ours. The decision is the community's. Right. And that is the whole point of you know UCP is uh, to engage with the community so that we, as humanitarian workers, UN agencies, you know, are no longer needed, that the community is self-sufficient to be able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And they are. It's not that they're not doing it. It's just that we are there to just give them that space to be able to do it, to protect them from harm. You know, Gandhi talks about this idea of Swadeshi and 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 Swaraj and self-rule and and our ability to be able to handle conflict in our midst is one of the key skills that we need all over the world. Uh, and so and it's wonderful that NP gets to continue this tradition of creating tools and capacities for yeah. conflict resolution. Now, 
Uh, Yasmin, where are you from? Because I know that peacekeepers come, unarmed peacekeepers from nonviolent peace force come from all over the world and they work all over the world. And you're, you're working, you're not volunteering, you're getting paid for the work that you do, which is important that people know these are real jobs or, you know, some, they're paid jobs at least. Uh, so where are you from and then how did you get involved in NP? Um, I'm actually from Somalia. Um, and uh, I live and work um, in Somalia for many years. Um, and I moved to the UK, um, London as a refugee, then moved back home after education. So um, I'm back home. And I found out about NP through friends mm-hmm. who told me about uh, the concept of UCP. And uh, I've always worked with communities, and it just seemed like a very um, natural fit. Um, so I applied, and uh, luckily they took me on, and I've been with them um, for a while now. So it's, it, it's been a very interesting and rewarding and entirely different concept um, to work with, well, it's, engage with. It's it's really awesome work, and yeah. I, I, I we admire it so much that, you know, even though... We're not doing the work in the field. We try to support the work of NP in any way that we can because mm-hmm. we know that it takes all kinds of people in all kinds of places to, you know, some people are out in the field and some people are helping to tell the stories and uh, some people are just learning about it for the first time. But that learning about it is part of the work, too. We have to know it exists. So you're at the UN right now. You and uh, you're doing presentations about the work of unarmed civilian protection, or, or why are you there? Yeah, so um, this week there's been a the the representative permanent uh, representative for Poland have convened uh, almost a week long activities and sessions on protection of civilians, and luckily for us, wow. NP has come to do a side event on the use of unarmed civilian peacekeeping to protect civilians. Oh, that should um, be the okay. main event. <laughs> yeah, should be. No, we've we've had, uh, people have been welcoming and we've had a lot of meetings to discuss because the the concept of UCP is, it is quite, it is old and it has been used, but it's still in the world of UN. It's still a very new concept. Um, that people try to get their heads around. So we've been really meeting a lot of people to um, give them a reality of what UCP is and how it works and how the community works by showing them visually mm-hmm. that it's, it's, it may be different, but it's ultimately the same principle, which is to protect civilians. Ooh, what, at times of war. Yes, and it's so wonderful that you get to participate. It's really historic what you're doing, I, that you are participating in this awakening, this world awakening to the work of unarmed. Thank you. Yes, and so thank you for what you're doing. And, you know, down the road, other generations are going to look and they're going to know your name because you are pioneering this work. So thank you. No, thank you. Well, we we really hope, um, me and Carmen coming here, we hope that they know the names of the communities and the countries that we're doing this because uh, ultimately that's that's a legacy we're going to try to leave behind because... We are in multiple countries implementing programs. Um, thousands of women, men, youth are doing UCP voluntarily all across these countries um, compared to 160 staff members in South Sudan, compared to over 200, um, 2,000, you know, youth and women who are conducting peace. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's the future and the legacy we're trying to leave behind. So. I hope they know them more than they know us. Well, it's beautiful. Thank you for thank you for pointing that out too. Yeah. Yes. And now you have a colleague with you. Um, yes. Carmen yeah. Lausanne. We'd love to talk with Carmen too. Yes, she's just right here. Let me pass the phone to you. Yes. Thank you, Yasmin. Okay. Can you hear me? Hello, Stephanie. Hi, Carmen. How are you? Hi. I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. So you... are just wrapping up some work here in New York. It is our last day. So we'll be leaving, uh, going back home. Yes. And so what has been your impression of the reception of 
uh, of the United Nations and the friends, the new friends you're meeting there, to the concept of unarmed civilian protection, and what sh- maybe what yeah, are some of the challenging meant, questions? The way asked. I looked at it, mm-hmm. there are um, interests among uh, the people that we talked to or those who have attended. Um, I mis- I can see that there is hope in. Mm-hmm promoting further and scaling up the use of an armed civilian for peacekeeping. But then, you know, it's really like a paradigm shift that might not be easy and may take long to really be completely embraced and accepted by the UN as as, as as an international body, but individually within the different um, missions, we can see that the interest is there. That's really that's really hopeful news, and I hope that the people who get to listen to this show really feel special that they heard some of the best news happening out there in the world. That at a at a high level, uh, there yes, are people and, working to change the paradigm yeah, of security. In, in fact, I think it's about time that people look <laughs> at other ways. It's mm-hmm. about time that uh, we will be more creative, we'll be more open to other options and ways by which uh, we address the different conflicts around the world, especially since for the last how many decades, since the 1940s when the UN started, you know, violence and armed conflict never stopped. I mean, there must be something that we are not doing well or we are not effectively doing that can really make a difference in the lives of people who are affected by wars, who are affected by conflicts and violence around the world. Right. I read that. What we're saying is even the unarmed civilian protection of peacekeeping is is not new. There's nothing new about this. It has been there since even before the UN, will, uh, I mean, the practice of the communities, no? To yes. protect, to mediate their own conflicts, to prevent violence in their communities. That has been there, that, that needs to be tapped and be maximized and be um, mainstreamed, be, be part of an institutional framework. So... Um, I remember one of our speakers in the side event, who is a member of the high-level independent panel that looked into the who studied the peacekeeping operations, saying that an armed civilian peacekeeping was how it was when peacekeeping by the UN was conceptualized hmm. at the beginning. It was really the idea of having an armed peacekeepers. Oh. But throughout the years some some have something evolved that it came to be known now as it is and operates the way it operates right now, which is now being recognized that is not enough. It's inadequate. There must be some things that needs to be reviewed and reformed, if I may say so. Say it. <laughs> you know, I think it's also important that the the language that you're using, because as, you, as you're holding the idea of this paradigm shift of the way we do security and protection, you're you're not saying that the other way is bad or it's wrong. You're saying it's inadequate. It's not doing it the work that it intends to do because you're there There's on the ground and lacking. you're seeing, yeah. you're seeing the something effect. lacking. And then if you can look at it, um, in our own discussion, the discourse even in peacekeeping, when you have forces outside of a community, strangers may be, who come in and then who goes out after a mission. Right. So it's really an entirely uh, new new approach to solving conflicts or addressing the roots of conflict. Interesting. And now, what how did you? Is, yeah. How did you get involved, Carmen? You're in Mindanao. Yes, yes. Yes. And so, where are you yes. from? And then, how I did you get involved been in Mindanao? Into this kind of work, actually, even before MP came. 
to the Philippines. Uh-huh. So from the beginning, I have started my work as a human rights advocate, a human rights worker, and then in, I was a peace um, advocate. I've, I've been able to go around the different conflict areas around the country. In fact, uh, one of my first work was really uh, delivering humanitarian assistance to displaced communities who have been victims of militarization. So it happened that in 2007, when NP came, I was with an NGO that was consulted by NP also when it was starting to come in. So I'm I'm very familiar with how it works, and eventually when there was a post that was um, announced and I was free from my other commitments, I, I applied with NP. So now I'm officially serving as the Program Development Officer of the NP Philippines office. Wow, that's and it's so wonderful to hear that, you know, the your background as a very serious peace advocate that's really putting now you're putting your life on the line for this mm-hmm. work. I mean, you are willing to risk your life just like a soldier is willing to risk yeah. their life. And yeah. can you talk about any of the work or stories that are coming out of Mindanao that help us to understand? Uh, some people might yeah. not even know about any conflict there, for example. Yeah, in, in our side event, I highlighted one very concrete incident, a story that is really very close to my heart. When there was this um, remote community in in Maguindanao province, and there is a school there where the children of the armed groups are studying. And then two years ago, during a graduation ceremony, it turned out because both sides are present in, in the school uh, uh, premises, the armed groups clashed with each other mm. and it disrupted the entire graduation program. So all these children is tampering and it was really very chaotic, very, very violent because it's really the, very close, the, the, the fighting. So what NP did after that graduation, was to engage the community, engage the school, and engage the armed groups. Because NP has been known in that community, so they know already that um, some kind of a protective accompaniment and protective uh, presence can be done by our uh, peacekeepers, by our civilian peacekeepers. So the next year... During the graduation ceremony again, our monitors in that field team really made sure that the presence are in the strategic location and all over, literally all over the school premises. So they were watching. In fact, one of the story of our staff was one was by the stage, at the backstage, by the school entrance, by the school exit, they were on the ground doing their patrol, and they were all unarmed. They were wearing our uniform, which is a vest that says "Nonviolent Peace Force." Mm-hmm. And then, but they made sure that the armed groups were not able to get inside the premises with their arms. So even if there are parents, relatives, and family members of the graduating students. They won't be able. To, they were not able to get into the school with their arms. So, when the preparations were done to make sure that the school is secured during that program, so the what happened was the family, the pre, the, the the families of the graduating students and all the other students, while they still have the trauma of the previous graduation violence, they gained some confidence to attend. And it was really a successful graduation ceremony. No violence. It went on smoothly. So the idea that just the mere presence of an armed civilian doing right. patrols, making the rounds, so it's really like 
giving a sense of security to the community right and delivering that message to the armed actors whoever are involved in the conflict that they are being watched so in a sense that's that's the big boost to the confidence and the sense of safety and security of the families of the civilians in that community so that's just one concrete example right and that's and a, another yeah oh that's i just wanted to add something and add a question for you because yeah. i've been in situations even at an uh, at an airport going to a specific country where there were guns present in order to make people feel safe that uh you know people there were soldiers ready to uh <laughs> threaten yes. to threaten everybody so can you will be, yeah so can you can you talk uh can you talk to me about why unarmed protect, protection then was more effective than having soldiers or or even UN guards with guns saying that we are watching this graduation um why was that more effective or what what was your experience there i think it's because the environment is really very hostile already mm-hmm. and when you add up to the violence again i mean it's really the concept of violence cannot be solved by another violence so when you see that there are a lot of guns already proliferating and that has become the normal thing when when there is something that is unarmed is something radical and that makes people make a second look oh that's something different like when you see everybody has have, have been bearing arms in a community and then you get to see all these unarmed people coming in and they're not afraid at all facing all those armed armed people so somehow that that makes you think yeah and you know there's something strange about that and there's something powerful about that and you know what it yeah. makes me feel like is that if i if i were to see that and i were to see that in order for somebody to feel safe they have a gun then so i would feel i need one of those to make me safe but if i see yeah, women and not. Yeah. other people that are that are doing protection work and they don't have a gun and yet they're making people without other people feel safe and they're unarmed uh i would feel like i want to do that too how can yeah. i do that how can i access that power within me and have you ever been scared as a as a peacekeeper for myself no no you've never been scared wow no <laughs> not at all mhm in fact there are several areas in the country that is really very vulnerable to different forms of uh violence but I think it is my trust in the people because that that's how we've been operating we we we're there we're well connected we're we're very much within the community we know what they feel we know what they think right. they trust us we trust them so much so whenever there's any threat or even a potential threat we are informed so there's that that mutual trust between the mm-hmm. peers in their community and the community themselves that even providing us early warning signs the information just coming from them to be relayed to us is already an indication right. that they wouldn't want anything harm to happen to us and this that will also put their lives or their communities at a greater danger or risk you know we're not there and it's inc- it's really like incredible stakeholders of the peace yeah yeah well, it's incredible carmen because here you are saying that we can you you've you've just given like an a master class in conflict resolution and nonviolence within just a minute really of what you're saying and that's really the beauty of uh folks who are in the nonviolent peace force is that you are so steeped in it you don't realize how beautiful what you're saying really is and how and how wonderful what you're saying is cuz i heard that we can understand com- we we don't have to wait until violence breaks out to understand that a com- that that could happen 
There are signs. There's early warning signs. One. Secondly, that you, the, the means that you're using, nonviolence, you're really, the way that you are defining nonviolence here that I hear is you're saying trust and good communication. Yeah. Because when trust breaks down, that's when violence happens. When communication yeah. breaks down, that's when violence happens. And when there's no trust or communication, boy, watch out. That's a, that's a exactly. real sign. So how simple is that, that in our everyday lives, we can work on building our capacity to trust, our capacity for people to trust us, and our, mm-hmm. and our tools of how to communicate well with everybody. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Carmen, thank you for yeah. joining us on Nonviolence Radio. And just oh, give us a sense honest. of how we can support the Nonviolent Peace Force, because you guys are at the UN right now. Uh, then you're going back to you're going back to Mindanao. Um, Yasmin will be going back to her post in South Sudan. South Sudan, yeah. Um, so how can we support you guys? I think just spreading the word would be enough. Spreading, I know, when you hear it, you want to... Spreading the word, like, the, the word to, especially to decision makers. If more people will be talking about this, more people will get to engage their own governments, their own local government officials. Maybe somehow some more... Someday, the the um, the snowball will really roll, and you know, a big constituency clamoring for this kind of an approach will will be heard. Mm-hmm. By those who are in power, those who are in a position to make decisions on what peace should be for our world, for our country. And I want more people like you and Yasmin and all the people that you work with in your communities to be those people in power. Right? Yes. I would <laughs> so thanks again for joining us. And we look forward thanks to supporting to your work me. and, and uh, my pleasure. wishing you the best. Thank Great. you. Yeah. Have a nice day. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm sitting here in silence, sending people smiles and realizing when we send out love, it keeps on rising. So I choose to close my eyelids to send positive vibes and to every living being from the ocean to the skies. And as I look at all the crisis, I realize that I just can send my love and prayers and forgive all of my rivals. To me, this is all priceless to transform all the violence through sacrifice and trying, sitting on this cushion silent. May all all beings be happy, peaceful and nonviolent. May not one being suffer in the mind, even the tyrants. May all souls find alignment with their hands, their hearts and minds. And may all of us keep walking from ignorance to be wiser like. Stephanie Van Hook, and you're at Nonviolence Radio. And nonviolence is happening all over the world, though it's underreported in the mass media. Our next segment is the Nonviolence Report with Michael Nagler. Michael's the president of the Meta Center for Nonviolence and author of The Third Harmony, Nonviolence and the New Story of Human Nature, as well as the Nonviolence Handbook. He'll share news, events, and analyses which might even inspire you to take action where you live. Let's tune in. (laughs) 
Greetings, everyone. This is Michael Nagler from the Meta Center, and I'm reporting into you for this episode of the Nonviolence Report. There is, as usual, a lot going on. There's a very interesting angle on the probably the most intense and uh, difficult conflict going on in the world right now, which is the overthrow, attempted overthrow, attempted so far anyway, in Myanmar. And one interesting angle is, I'll have a lot to say about the Myanmar conflict in a little bit, but an interesting angle that is in an article in The New Yorker is the internet access. You know, there's such a, a we, we make such a fuss about the technology that's available uh, or not these days. And uh, the internet access is complicated because if the regime shuts it down, which they want to do, to stop the protests from communicating, then the country can't function. It really needs their internet. And if they have it up, so are the protests. So uh, just one of the interesting little complications that's come up in modern nonviolent action. As I say, more on me and more in a minute. D.C. peace teams, you know, Washington, D.C. peace teams is definitely doing its homework, I'm happy to say. They are reporting on the outcomes of their events, recent events, around the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, oh, that sounds strange, an attack on the Capitol. We're talking about our own Capitol. Well, they will be providing the raw material then for history and best practices as we go forward and learn our techniques and improve. Around this uh, same time, there's a typical peace team action that's coming up that isn't domestic. It's uh, Meta Peace Teams, M-E-T-A with one T, and they are now recruiting volunteers for an action this summer, an intervention which would be in Israel-Palestine. And I just wanted to read to you some of the language from their description because it is uh, so instructive and so typical of how peace teams are organized and what they do. So they first state that they have been invited, and that is an important principle that's always followed. I, I didn't think it was all that important, but I, I probably was wrong, uh, that you only go where you have been invited. That's a way of avoiding what's called peace imperialism, you know, where we march in and say, here's, here's peace, whether you want it or not. So they've been invited to place an international peace team in the West Bank by Palestinians. And I'm reading again. By Palestinians who are committed to nonviolence and striving for justice under occupation. So that's another important principle. We try to limit our services to communities that are committed to nonviolence for the obvious reasons. And the next part I wanted to stress is that team members will be prepared through an extensive training program. So prior to departure, people will be taught how to do unarmed civilian protection, which is the main activity of peace teams these days, human rights monitoring and reporting, extension of that, how to use protective accompaniment most effectively and other creative tools of nonviolence. The preparation also includes learning the culture and history of the Palestine-Israel difficulty in the West Bank. And they go on to say living conditions can be kind of basic uh, where they'll be working, and they may include staying with Palestinian families. So I've always said that uh, the basic training would have to be three parts. It would have to include uh, local conditions, which was the last one I just mentioned, the basic principles of nonviolence, and the specifics of uh, accompaniment and other activities done by these teams. So Myanmar in the news again. I'm a member of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, which is a professional association for peace scholars. And on the 16th of March, they will be doing a conversation called Myanmar, Hong Kong, and Egypt, from activism to strategy. It's uh, the first webinar in a new series, which they're calling the Improving Practice Webinar Series in this year. And they will be sharing their thoughts on keeping a peaceful movement 
and one of the participants will be the author Lisa Schirsch, who has been one of the important historians of the nonviolent movement. And she's working now with a group called SNAP, and that is an acronym for Synergizing Nonviolent Action and Peace Building. And that is an action guide, and she'll facilitate the conversation. So we have more uh, learning formats that are being added to our repertoire, and all that is very much to the good. Meantime, uh, this is something similar. Nonviolence International, that was started by Mubarak Awad and is based in Washington, D.C., on the 10th of this month, March 10th, at 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, that's uh, 7 our time, and it's called Resisting Occupation, Connecting Palestine and Western Sahara. So obviously our colleague and friend, Stephen Zunas, whom we interviewed recently, who is really the foremost news conveyor about Western Sahara, uh, and a serious conflict in Northern Africa, which we would have known almost nothing about. And I don't want to go back into all of the details now, but uh, he's an expert both in Palestine and Western Sahara, and he'll be one of four presenters. And this is actually likely to be a historic webinar because it's one of the first public discussions between Sahrawis and Palestinians who have a similar struggle. It's about their occupation. It's about a struggle for justice under those conditions. And there are now more than 100 countries which have historical claims of some kind or another over neighboring territory. You know, think of China and Tibet. And uh, if we start using those as making an exception to the uh, prohibition against the use of military force, and we start doing interventions in all of them, you can imagine how much violence could unfold. Well, now to look at Myanmar for a moment, the last uh, we heard, there are almost 40 people, protesters who have been killed, and the military government is increasing its use of violent tactics to attempt to deal with the mostly peaceful protesters. Now, that mostly is an important qualification because the fact is even a little bit of violence can mitigate the nonviolent impact of an episode. So there are some episodes of protesters who have thrown Molotov cocktails at the police, which of course has only resulted in further escalation. But on the other hand, they are finding increasingly creative ways to protest. They're blocking traffic. There's something called an onion protest where they drop bags of onions on the street and slowly go around picking them up so that they can't be accused of illegally disrupting traffic. And uh, then they're boycotting the lottery to disrupt an important source of income for the regime. Reporters have been refusing to attend press conferences with the new government, that is the military junta. And uh, some of these methods really are questionable, it's like a curse campaign, which consists of naming and shaming generals. I think in Gandhian principled nonviolence, you would never do that. You never do anything to compromise the dignity of a person, whoever that person is, in any way. And uh, when you think about it, all of these varied tactics fall into the general category of what we call obstructive program. What I have yet to see, that doesn't mean it's not there, but what I have yet to see, and certainly what's yet to be reported on in the news, is what we might call constructive program, where people will be creating schools and community organizations and so forth. Well, to move on now to another resource, even in death, it seems, the great Abdul Ghaffar Khan is making peace and making contributions to nonviolence because his biography, My Life and Struggle, has recently been translated and, and just come available uh, to us through uh, India. 
And what's interesting in particular is that this publication was a joint venture of India and Pakistan. So it, there is an increasing consciousness, in fact, among the Pakhtun community, or we used to be called the Patans, uh, who are against oppression and war, and that has led to a resurgence of interest in Bacha Khan, his powerful weapon of nonviolence, his emphasis on including women in all walks of life, his belief in religious tolerance, his legacy of speaking truth to power. Now, all these things are of increasing relevance. And Malala Yousafzai, who is Pakhtun, and who is the youngest person to ever receive a Nobel Peace Prize, she said this, Bacha Khan's message of the power of peaceful protest for liberty, equality, and justice change our culture and customs forever and inspires me every day in my activism for girls' education and women's empowerment. Well, there's so much available now, and uh, it's uh, rewarding when it's not bewildering to consider it, but Pace Bene, the Franciscan organization, is doing a six-week workshop, which will take place on Zoom, and I'm particularly fond of this one because it's called Compassion as Presence, Level 2, there was a Level 1, level two of applying meditation for nonviolent living. You know, I have long felt that meditation is going to be the most powerful tool that we can use for any kind of nonviolent or constructive work. So it's a two hour workshop. It's going to be Tuesday, April 6th from 2 to 4 p.m. Pacific time. And they're going to have some of the foremost authorities on Kingian nonviolence in education. The uh, facilitator of this will be Veronica Polly Cottage, and it'll cost $80. There's a new book uh, called The Glossary of Civil Resistance, a resource for study and translation of key terms. And this is being brought to us by the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict. The authors are Hardy Merriman, who's the executive director of ICNC, and Nicola Barak Yusufi. So it's taken them six years to create this. They have defined over 150 key terms, use them in sentences, have extensive commentary and introduction, and links to translations of key civil resistance terminology in 31 languages. I have yet to see this wonderful resource, but it promises to be really excellent given the quality of the work that is done by ICNC. So uh, moving around the world a little bit uh, in a historic referendum that took place recently in Ecuador, in the city of uh, Cuenca, which is the third largest city in that country, voted to ban mining in the area. And that was uh, more than 80% of the electorate voted for that. Meanwhile, the Peace Alliance based back here in Washington, D.C., has listed a number of ways that people can get involved this month. And you can find that on the Peace Alliance website. I won't go into all of them here. But they do point out that there are three interesting bills before Congress. H.R. 350, which is a Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act. H.R. 666, hmm, that's an uncomfortable number, isn't it? Uh, which is called Anti-Racism and Public Health Act. And finally, the sponsor of this one being uh, our Oakland representative, Barbara Lee, H.R. 1111, to finally establish a department of peacebuilding, something that was originally proposed, if I'm remembering correctly, in 1784. So, you know, you don't want to fool around with peace. Uh, there will be an introduction to a restorative justice workshop also on March 6th, and an advanced one on March 20th that the DC Peace Teams, who I mentioned before, will be doing. And you can get their information on uh, DC Peace Teams website. One more thing, meanwhile, from Meta Peace Teams, I mentioned a uh, big resource of theirs coming up later, 
will be a workshop called Stories of Nonviolent Tactics, De-Escalating Tension. Uh, you know, as, as we've known for some time, when it comes to teaching people how they can behave and what to do, nothing seems to be as effective as story. Several books in the education field have kind of established that. You can try to explain to young people why they should behave in a particular way. It's not likely to have much effect. If you tell them a story, even if you don't tell them the, the meaning of the story, the impact at the end, uh, they will get it from that narrative because they identify with the characters. So I mentioned that things are heating up in Myanmar. Unfortunately, the same is happening in India, where the government also has been increasing their tactics, unethical as they are, because they have been made increasingly uneasy about the protests. So they've been doing things like cutting water, electricity, and telecommunications for the activists who are camping at the protest locations. And this escalation of theirs seems to be backfiring as it's drawing in tens of thousands of new protesters. And this is a good example of what George Lakey used to call a dilemma action, where you put your opponent in such a position that if they don't re try to repress you, of course you win. And if they do try to repress you, you also win because of the, the backlash that we're seeing happening now in India. It still remains a very tense situation that requires changing tactics and another way of approach uh, because the, the protests and, rep and the repressions are just being very costly and not really seeming to move the conversation forward. Uh, so as you see, I am jumping around and back here in the USA, there was a petition calling on the President Biden to stop the Line 3 pipeline project, which is in Minnesota. And again, the issue, just as a standing rock, is fracking of oil versus the fresh water supply. The uh, indigenous people in this case are the Anishinaabe. And uh, he has, re he, because he has blocked the Standing Rock protest, uh, he's now being called upon to follow suit and do the same thing with line three. So once again, we seem to have a lot of um, conflicts, a lot of campaigns that are hanging in the air in the meantime. The Institute for Local Self-Reliance has launched a campaign to build 30 million solar homes with a focus on localism Remember Gandhi's Swadeshi, localism? They're not just looking at energy. They have other initiatives that they're looking at, such as a community broadband network initiative and an independent business initiative. And these are really good examples of constructive program where you build what you need instead of, or at least before, calling on the regime to stop doing something that you don't want them to do. And also, there's a, there are three cities in the U.S. that are switching to what they call life-affirming economies. And you can read about that in Yes! magazine. So that is the report for now. As you can see, there's a mixture of good news and bad news from the point of view of outcomes. But the overall movement in terms of the development of nonviolence, its sophistication and learning tactics is improving dramatically. And that is bound to be uh, creating an impulse or a force for a better future. So that is the episode for this week. And I look forward to reporting again with you soon. Thank you. Thinking and I'm thinking, what's the reason why we holding back from being kind? What's the disease? But then I sense we are fine. 
It'll all happen One small step at a when time When the world is full of violence And it needs a little kindness I just sit and pray in silence And God shows me the signs Open my eyes Realize We are fine One small act at a time Last night I'm walking home And the homeless man says hello With a smile to let me know That he's got a lot of hope He says have faith young man We are fine the world is kind, one small act at a time. Small acts we do together, even though maybe alone changes the world for the better so we can call it home. And this is life as we know when our hearts are aligned. The magic that unfolds, one small act at a time. Throw your heart up, let it fly high. Today, never thought this day would come Where I would feel it and say that Each and every one of us has paved the way Doing good and now we're all just moving up When I'm kind of you, you pay it forward This is how we yeah. build trust Never had faith, but now I'm seeing you I, t- I wanna gift you my life Wanna spread love before I die Thank you God for finally letting me realize When I serve man, I'm really serving you in disguise Smiles everywhere cause now everybody's got the bug Ain't no life without the love If it is, it ain't no fun What we gonna do now? Just grab a friend and give a hug Spread it out real wide so everyone can be touched Show your hearts up, let it fly high Every single living soul Can you see a love for me shining through? Cause what you see in me, I can see in you And soon enough, you and me will be out of time And kindness will be all we can leave Time and kindness will be all we can be.